you know, we have about ten to fifteen thousand dollars sunk into our home bar because of you. And I'm like, that is your own fault. That's, that, that book was just for entertainment purposes. That's, that's not an investment vehicle. Hi, I'm Dave Kaplan, founder and co-owner of Death & Company, here to talk to you today about Cocktail Codex, which gives you sort of a full understanding and landscape of the cocktail world through six root cocktails. You're watching Nick Drinks. Nick Drinks. I'm David Kaplan, owner of Gin & Luck, um, best known for Death & Company, uh, and we also have uh, Proprietors LLC, which is our consulting vertical. Uh, we've come out with a couple of books, and uh, yeah, kind of cocktail culture is, is kind of our driving force, foundation, and passion. So Death & Co. New York has been around for 14 years. Uh, Death & Co. Denver, which is our most recent, has been open for about a year and a half now. Um, fantastically different, very different properties. Uh, New York is, uh, when I ask people to tell me about you know, New York or how they describe it, they usually say uh, great cocktails, uh, nice service, and really dark. Death & Go Denver is massive. We're inside a beautiful hotel called The Ramble, and uh, we have soaring windows, double height uh, ceiling, massive chandeliers, uh, and daylight. We serve breakfast, lunch, dinner, do events, so very different expression of that brand. And then we're about to open Death & Co. LA, which will be our third. The evolution of New York or the New York cocktail scene in the last 14, 15 years since, uh, since I really moved there and started on building Death & Co., started, sort of started on that project, uh, to today uh, has been really amazing. I mean, of course, you see kind of the cocktail proliferation all over the US and all over the world, and you see kind of these different tendrils and, and kind of tangents and expressions. Um, one thing we certainly didn't have uh, for the first five, six, seven years uh, was kind of cocktail tourism, which is definitely a thing, um, just like we have uh, culinary tourism. I know I certainly travel for, uh, for amazing restaurants or chefs and, and those moments and experiences. Uh, you know, we're now fortunate in this industry to get to experience that as well. So we'll have people come in uh, to, to New York and they'll want to tick the box. They have 10 bars that they want to go see. Um, and we were actually just talking about it, or I was eavesdropping here uh, at Willis Bar and listening to some of the staff say, oh, when I was in New York, I went to this bar, this bar, this bar. We were staying over here, so we popped by this bar afterwards. Um, and those were the bars that I got to see that time. Um, but it's not just the folks that are geeky enough to work in this industry. It's really kind of um, you know, fans, enthusiasts, and, and almost anyone that has kind of a, a love for, for cocktails and culinary. And uh, you see it in every magazine that you open, every in-flight magazine, um, almost every television show has some sort of cocktail or culinary anchor. Um, and of course, we're still drafting behind culinary, uh, but it's getting close. It's getting closer and closer, which, which is really exciting. One of the things that, that I really enjoy as cocktail culture is, is sort of growing. And as I get to visit all these different cities, you know, we, we came out with the Death & Go book five years ago, actually October 7th. So we're celebrating our five year anniversary just, to, just a couple days ago. Um, and uh, for that book, I did a, you know, a 15 city tour uh, around the US, got to see all these different cities that, that I otherwise you know, hadn't been to or wouldn't have gone to. Um, and uh, similarly, we're here at Willis Bar, uh, Willis Show Bar for Cocktail Codex tonight. Um, you know, each city that I've been to and, and gotten the pleasure to, uh, to visit and spend time at, they, you know, you, you see kind of the evolution and, and the arc of, of them kind of finding their own voice. And Detroit, I think like many cities, they start with kind of the, the sort of pseudo speakeasy, kind of their, everyone's idea of what a traditional cocktail bar is. And then they kind of lean into who they are and what their city is and, and what they're looking for. Um, I've gotten to experience it uh, and watch it firsthand in Los Angeles. Uh, I was living out there for seven years. Uh, it's where our consulting company, Proprietors LLC, was and is based. And again, it's where we're opening Death & Co. in, in just a few weeks. Um, and obviously, LA is an entertainment-based industry. So, so many of the bars, so many of the cocktail bars don't really, you can call them cocktail bars, but one of my favorites, The Spare Room, is uh, Bowling Alley. They have live music, they have book clubs, they have so much programming, and they build this like robust entertainment into, uh, it, it's almost equal to, to their core DNA of being a cocktail bar. Uh, the Houston Brothers, they have uh, tightrope walkers, they have aerialists, they, you know, they have these sort of fantastical entrances, you know, they are very much of LA, you know, the fantasy that is LA. Uh, and I think in the same way, Detroit has really kind of found its voice 
um, and, and kind of leaned into what kind of experience it wants to be when you go out to a cocktail bar. Um, it's slightly less stuffy, it's slightly less uh, precious. Um, it can go in a few different directions. You know, you want that vibrancy of what this city is. You want the music. Um, you know, some of the bars uh, that I've been to late night, like the standby turns into almost like kind of a little cocktail clubby lounge, you know, which just doesn't, we don't have one of those in New York. Like it's, you know, so it, it's cool that as uh, this culture proliferates, we start to see these different expressions. We started getting asked, I started getting asked about a Death & Go book about one year in to operating or owning Death & Co. Um, I was 24 when we opened. Uh, we opened with an old-fashioned cash register. We were running on triplicates, like triple page tickets. Uh, we had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. So when someone asked, like, when are you guys coming out with a book? I was like, I don't even know how to run a bar, let alone write a book. I, I, you know, I don't know the first thing about what I'm doing. So um, it, it was a number of years later before we really started kind of thinking critically about that space. And similar to, to Death & Co, when I was looking to open that bar, I really wanted, I felt and really believed that there was uh, kind of a hole in the market. Like there were these great cocktail bars that I loved and I just thought were so aspirational and phenomenal, but there wasn't from a customer facing um, point of view, there wasn't the experience that I wanted uh, yet. You know, I wanted to go to a place, sink into the booth, have the environment feel absolutely enveloping, have time just, just slip away, have uh, food, cocktails, wine, um, great service, and of course, very dark. Um, and uh, and I, I didn't see it, I, can, I didn't get to experience it. So that's what we built with Death & Co. Um, and similarly within the book space, once I really started doing kind of a hard look into kind of what cocktail books there were, are out there at the time, um, I didn't feel like there was any one book that represented us, you know, this culture, like, you know, people that were cocktail enthusiasts or bar owners or patrons or, or anything. Like all of these books were very sterile. They were great and informative and I love them, but they were kind of like dry cookbooks. They weren't like, like so many, um, restaurant cookbooks that really felt of place. So with Death & Co, it was absolutely my ambition to create a book that it felt like you were opening the door to you know, our little bar on 6th Street um, in New York when you open the cover of that book. You know, there are these amazing vignettes of, um, of our regulars. There's uh, kind of a transcript of what a tasting is like and all that like shorthand vernacular, like two, one, three quarter dash dash, or was it two, three quarter, three quarter dash? And like, you know, what all of that means um, and that shorthand and understanding that shorthand and why the regulars go and what a, what a day and night trajectory looks like. It really hopefully allows you to feel like um, you're part of that world and part of that, part of that bar. Yeah, once I realized that's what we wanted to do, um, the rest was relatively fortuitous, you know, kind of timing, similar to Death & Co, right place, right time, right, right idea, hopefully, and right team. And so with Cocktail Codex, uh, you know, we knew almost right away that we wanted to do another book. We had the, the reception to Death & Co Modern Classic Cocktails was so overwhelming in every way um, that I, I think myself, Alex, Nick, and definitely our publishers were like, great, what's next? Um, that said, everyone told us, they're like, well, sophomore efforts almost always fail. Sophomore albums, sophomore books, whatever it is. I was like, okay, everyone wants us to do this, and now they're raining on our parade. Um, but it was, it was pretty, pretty quick, pretty short thereafter, shortly thereafter. Um, and it was a dramatically different experience for the Death & Go book we put together this absolutely beautiful proposal and everyone told me, they're like, you don't need to do all this. I spent money on designers, photographer. We got it actually printed and it was a similar trim size to what the book actually is. And I was like, no, you know, if we're going to do this, I, I want to create my book. Like, I want this to be the Death & Co book and expression. I don't want this to go through whatever filter uh, that the publishers have. Um, and so in the end, we got to work with 10 Speed. They believed in that book and we made what looks almost identical to the book proposal. With uh, Cocktail Codex, we put together a two page idea uh, just in Word and we sent it to them and they were like, great. <laughs> like, here's a book deal. 
Um, you know, Death & Co, the Death & Co book broke every sales record within the cocktail book category. Um, and it really, as per, like my, my favorite sort of quote was from our publisher, Aaron, and he said, uh, you know, the Death & Go book d has done for cocktails uh, what Thomas Keller's book did for, uh, for the cookbook world. Uh, cocktail Codex is 100% sort of cocktail theory um, and really trying to contextualize the landscape in hopefully a new and interesting way. And it came from, this book came so much from, you know, the mind of Alex Day, um, just sitting there for hours and months and days on end, typing away, and then, you know, working collaboratively to create this beautiful book, and Nick sort of refining and editing that down, and then working with 10Speed to, to sort of shape it and make sure that, you know, it's clear. With the growth of Death & Co, I said, look, I'm, there's so much that we left unsaid, you know, the content in the Death & Go book now is seven years old. We've, we've grown so much, we've done so much more, and there's so much we want to say and do. Um, I was like, I really want to quite literally triple down and just put everything we have behind this new book. So we just announced, and that book's coming out sometime in about a year and a half. It's a slow process. Uh, so Cocktail Codex, uh, the, the ambition of the book is, is to really give you a full understanding of the cocktail landscape and contextualize almost every cocktail out there within six root cocktails. Uh, so we'll see if I get them in order. Uh, but the Martini, uh, the Sidecar, uh, the Daiquiri, uh, the Flip, uh, the Old Fashioned, and the Whiskey Highball. Ha ha, six. So the, one of the main differences between the two books, uh, one of the many, I suppose, is that Death & Co, the Death & Co Modern Classic Cocktail Book is unapologetic. Like those are just cocktails straight from the bar and they're all very difficult to make. They take a lot of ingredients uh, or at least it, sourcing them is very difficult to do. A lot of infusions. Uh, Cocktail Codex sort of walks you through within each chapter uh, telling you what kind of the root or classic recipe is, what our take or interpretation of that recipe is, and then taking you through all sorts of sort of what, what you may think are tangential cocktails that are related to that root recipe. So in that way, it's a, it's a phenomenal book for kind of home bartenders to really give you an understanding um, of all these different drinks. But there's also a lot of drinks in here that are just easy to make in terms of their ingredients. And my particular soft spot um, is definitely the martini. Uh, we have kind of a first pay or a first person narrative uh, in each of the chapters. And of course, mine is about the martini, my love affair with the martini, how I first discovered or saw the martini, which was in my aunt's hand. My aunt is this amazing sort of Chicago socialite, you know, very, very, very skinny and always wearing gorgeous clothes and, and always kind of uh, socializing through these fantastic kind of uh, parties and always, you know, her prop always forever in her hand was this kind of old school 10 ounce martini glass and she's just coasting through. Um, so of course it was one of the first drinks I ever wanted to try. Not the martini that I love today and that it's sort of just a warm bath of vodka. Um, but I think the martini is one of those recipes that is so personal, can be so personalized that everyone can have one. There's sort of one expression or variation for everyone. So that's definitely my favorite, selfishly, personally favorite piece of, uh, of Cocktail Codex. So one of the best things, again, about a martini is that, you know, there's, there's one for everyone. And for me, there's almost like one for any time of day. So, you know, if it's midday, and it's lunch and it's a meeting and I don't really feel like wine, but a martini might, you know, kind of knock me out for the rest of the work I have to do. You can order a 50-50 martini, um, you know, which, which is just equal parts gin and vermouth. Uh, you can order, you know, a three to one as it gets a little later in the evening. Um, once you really want to put kind of a, a, a punctuation point on the evening, uh, sometimes I like my martinis incredibly dry, like a five to one martini. Uh, sometimes I like my martini with uh, a split, uh, split vermouth of blanc and dry, um, just to give it a little bit more kind of like rounded edge. Um, always with a dash of orange bitters, always with a lemon twist. So that's, that's my martini landscape right there. One of the little known truths about most folks that actually work in the bar industry, and this is not true for everyone, I'd say most, is that when we go home, we don't make drinks. And my dirty little secret, fairly well-known dirty little secret, is that I've never been a bartender. So when I go home, I definitely don't make drinks for myself. But what I do, 
uh, and I almost always have a few bottles sort of resting, is I will pre-batch uh, about you know, a liter of a couple different cocktails and I'll throw them in the freezer. So, um, and when you're doing that, it's important to, to consider fractional dilution. So sometimes, you know, depending on the cocktail, almost a third of that final thing that slid across the table in front of you, third to a fifth is water. So that water content comes from uh, the ice, bringing that cocktail down to temperature, but it's also introducing water to kind of thin and stretch that out and uh, lower the ABV or alcohol by volume a bit. So if you're batching, I'll literally just take, you know, a liter or 750 uh, bottle with like a swing top, um, measure out the ingredients, and then you do just a fractional fraction of the dilution that you would otherwise get in the martini um, that you would want to have. Uh, the other reason you do that, or one of the reasons you do that, is because when you throw it in the freezer, you want to make sure uh, that it won't actually freeze. So you need to do something that's pretty boozy. So like a four to one, five to one martini uh, with just, you know, two thirds of the water content that it would otherwise have in the final drink that won't freeze. Um, I always wait. I do uh, also cut down the bitters in there a bit. Um, so bitters somehow tend to kind of magnify as they sit rest or, or you put them in a batch so you don't do one-to-one -one bitters in terms of what the spec calls for. Um, but anytime you come over, you'll see I can just pull a few different batches out of the, uh, out of the freezer, uh, some old-fashioned variation and a martini variation. And that way it's all done for you. Um, you don't need any fresh ingredients other than uh, some lemon or orange twists, um, and, you're, uh, and you're ready to go. Other than that, just stock the basics. Don't go crazy. Don't try to make every cocktail from the Death & Co book. It's, it's nuts. I, I've, I've met plenty of fans that are like, you know, we have about ten to $15,000 sunk into our home bar because of you. And I'm like, that is your own fault. That's the, that book was just for entertainment purposes. That's, that's not an investment vehicle. So to, uh, to learn more about the Death & Co world, to learn more about Cocktail Codex, uh, you can visit uh, deathandcompany.com. You can visit any of our bars. You can follow us on Instagram. I feel like I'm selling a timeshare right now. Our Instagram handle is Death & Company uh, or at Death & Company. Um, and we, we work really hard, honestly, to put interesting content out there, information out there that we feel like our viewers or, or our followers will really want to engage in. Um, we don't believe that Instagram or Facebook or any of these things are just to tell you about our latest special. Uh, you know, we're a transparent company um, and we're really proud about being open book with, uh, with all of our, our staff um, and being transparent and sort of teaching or informing all of our guests anything and everything they want to know, um, which is why we keep writing the books, honestly, is because we're just excited to share it.